Good afternoon and welcome to Kitty Talks. We share inspirational life stories that inspire you to create yours. And today I have with me the gorgeous Ruby Warrington. Hi, Ruby. Hello. Thank you for having me. Now, are you away from New York? Yes, from Brooklyn, Williamsburg, Brooklyn. Fabulous. And for those of you that don't know, Ruby is the founder of the Numinous. Did I pronounce that right? Numinous. Numinous. The founder of the Numinous. <laughs> <laughs> Um, Ruby's also a journalist, and she is just having her first book, Material Girl, Mystical World, published and coming out on the 2nd of May. Yes, indeed. Yeah, so thank you so much for joining us, Ruby. Really excited about our conversation. Well, thank you. Thank you for inviting me and just having spoken to you a bit about your mission and what you're here to do and what the purpose of these podcasts are. It's very much aligned with what I see as my work now. So I'm really happy to share some more about my story with you. Um, and hopefully provide some inspiration just through sharing my stories. Yeah, absolutely. Well, thank you so much. Yeah, I've, you know, I've I got sent the book. I'm a lucky lady. I got sent the book before, <laughs> before it's out, and I I have got this far through. So I haven't. No, I'm further through actually. But already, I, like I can agree, our missions are totally aligned. So yeah, thank you so much. So, um, do you mind just sharing with the audience a little bit more about who you are and what you're doing in the world? Sure. So, um, as you said, I now. In this, inca- in this incarnation in my life, run a conscious lifestyle platform called The Numinous. Um, the tagline is Material Girl, Mystical Worlds. That kind of came to me in the very beginning stages of creating this site. And really, it's, um, we cover, it's an online magazine and event series, and we cover all things new age, updated for the now age. So that means I cover everything, all sorts of mystical practices, philosophies, um, Etc. Everything from astrology through the tarot, through psychic things and shamanism, but through a very kind of non-woo-woo, modern, aspirational, beautiful lifestyle lens. So really my whole idea with the Luminous was to present all of these practices as not so fringe and not so weird and not so out there, but actually very useful, valuable, fun and exciting um, things to experiment and to use and as, to bring into our lives as tools for our own personal development, our own self-awareness, and also to have fun with. I find so many of these subject areas um, to be so fascinating and to bring so much kind of fun into my life. Um, so there's this kind of a humorous streak that runs through us all as well, which, um, which keeps things fun. Um, and as you said, I have um, a background in journalism, so I... Mm-hmm been working as a journalist now for almost 20 years since I graduated from journalism school in yeah. London um, and worked in the UK um, for many titles. I worked at Heat Magazine. I worked mm. for CAM newspaper. Um, I worked at Bliss Magazine. I've written for everything from Grazia through Red Magazine, through all of them really, um, and wound up in a job as Sunday as features editor at the Sunday Times magazine. Um, back in 2008, that was. And did you always know you wanted to be a journalist? Um, I always loved reading and writing. Mm-hmm. Um, English was like my best subject in school. Um, and then when I, as an early teenager, I really fell in love with magazines. But I was really fascinated and very entranced by the fashion industry. And so I kind of thought, oh, I want to be in fashion. I want to be a fashion designer. And then that modified to really wanting to work in magazines. And I thought, well, I want to be a fashion stylist then. And that's what I went to school, to London College of Fashion, to study styling. But actually, it was the writing, the journalism component of the course. that I really found a way to express myself that felt very authentic to me and really discovered how much I love to express myself through writing. And so that became my focus. I actually majored in journalism in that course, opposed to styling, and began writing for magazines before I'd even graduated, actually. Um, one of my tutors was consulting for various magazines at the time, and we commissioned me to write. So, so no, but I think I always, I, if, I'm, if I really tap into what I've always been, felt most comfortable doing, it has always been writing. So that married with my love of magazines and fashion um, led to the career in journalism. 
Mm, fantastic. And you did yeah. that for, well, how long have you been a journalist? 20 years now? Almost 20 years. And so I moved, so I moved to New York in 2012. My husband got a job over here. And at the time, I had my dream job, right? As a yeah. time style. Um, but as I write about in my book, I was actually secretly kind of behind the scenes, deeply unfulfilled and really very um, quite depressed, actually, at the fact that I'd achieved my biggest ambition as a journalist. And yet it wasn't really making me happy. I wasn't fulfilled. I was extremely stressed. I was very full of anxiety um, and just not and not really feeling like I was contributing to the world what I was here to do. Um, I say behind the scenes and in secret because how dare like how dare I? I yeah, you had the dream job. How dare I express anything less than utter kind of um, joy for having achieved this this position that so many people would kill for and all of that stuff. So I was kind of yeah, it was a very difficult time for me actually. And then the universe intervened. <laughs> it has a way of doing that. I got a job in New York. And so I left the, the Sunday Times and went freelance. And I still write, like, you know, this week, for example, I interviewed Naomi Watts for the cover of Red Magazine. Oh, okay. So I still have a foot in that world because I still do love writing. Yeah. I love writing. And any opportunity I get to do that. And I think essentially what I really love about writing, what I love about journalism, opposed to writing fiction for example is that I really love sharing people's stories which is what you're doing yeah (laughs) and because I think there's just such um such medicine for us all in listening to stories just hearing each other's stories and communing in that way so I think the very root of what I, I love doing with writing is really sharing stories so if I get to do that on my own platform now if I get to do that for other magazines and papers, then great. That's kind of me and my happy place. Mm. And take us to that point of transformation. Like I think, you know, you describe being working in the fashion industry and the fashion world for journalism, but it being a little bit empty. Was there like a pivotal moment that you knew you needed to change direction or it was the move, was it? Or No, I decided, I, I had, um, I guess I had a bit of a breakdown slash breakthrough slash spiritual <laughs> situation yeah. <laughs> a lot of those have probably, um, probably around eight or nine months before the move happened and I wouldn't say there was a any one moment um but there was certainly a period of a couple of months I suppose where I really had got to a point where I was feeling very depressed I wasn't sleeping properly um I would off, I would often feel tearful at work mm. um and I was feeling right just carrying a lot of anger um and I think I I, I you know, I booked up for the first time in my life to see a therapist because I was like, oh, there's obviously something deeply wrong with me <laughs> um, and didn't really resonate with her. And I think at that point, um, a couple of things happened. First of all, a nutritionist actually diagnosed that I was suffering adrenal fatigue, which is extremely common, wow. particularly um, with a, a very deadline focused job, can find themselves suffering from adrenal fatigue, which is essentially when you're you're overtaxing your adrenals mm. and you get a cycle of becoming over adrenalized, not being able to sleep, feeling exhausted, and then over re adrenalizing yourself. So it's a very addictive cycle physiologically. And this nutritionist advised me to cut out coffee and sugar, which I did. And within two weeks, it was honestly incredible. Like I just felt so much more at home in myself. I felt so much calmer. And at that, then had the knock-on effect of me really being able to kind of assess my situation calmly and objectively as opposed to being kind of like caught up in this kind of male emotions. Yeah. So from that place, I was able to say, well, what's really going on here? My work isn't fulfilling to me. Maybe I need something. Maybe I'll just get take up a hobby. I'll do something on the side that's like just for me. That mm. can kind of escape in a way. Um, and when investigating what that might be, when I say investigating, I'm just doing some self inquiry as to like, what would be the thing that I could always talk about and never get bored researching? And the thing that came to me was astrology. Mm. <laughs> always been a real passion of mine. But again, it was a little bit in the closet because it was a little bit weird and a bit woo woo. And I had a nickname, Mr. Groovy, <laughs> kind of tongue in cheek. Um, but I was like, I'm going to learn about astrology. Um, and so I introduced myself to Shelley von Strunkel, who yeah. many of you oh, know, yeah. the astrologer, resident, resident astrologer for I think about 25 years now at the Sunday Times. 
And she sort of took me under her wing a little and um, became a mentor to me in many ways. And I would go visit her and she'd talk to me about astrology and all these other mystical traditions that she's so well versed in. And I, I just felt like every, all these little light bulbs in my whole being just opening up as I was like, this is, this is what I find so exciting. This yeah. whole world is so full of possibilities and so um, fascinating and such a kind of wonderland. And she was the first person to use the word numinous in a conversation with me. Mm. And she said, she described the word as meaning um, or, or being used to describe the, that which is unknown or unknowable. And in re- relation to human experience, it really to me speaks to those human experiences we have that you can't really define by words, mm. that it's about a knowing or a feeling or this overwhelming sense of being part of something bigger and um, indefinable. Mm. And I just Seeing a word, I fell in love with that word. And immediately as I heard the word, I saw it as the kind of cover, like the title of the magazine. Oh, wow. That would present all of these subjects that I was getting an education in that felt so, so fascinating and enthralling to me in a very kind of glossy, chic, upscale way. Because I guess immediately I was thinking, well, there are so many people actually I know in the fashion magazine world who are actually secretly into this stuff. Mm. But they wouldn't dare admit it because it's so, in, in the US they say crunchy as in crunchy granola. <laughs> it's so crunchy and woo-woo and kind of hippie and weird. Like, what if we could present these subject matter in chic a beautiful chic way? Mm. I saw a gap in the market. And so again, but again, this is, you know, this was, and so I suppose, if anything, that moment was the moment of, aha, my path sort of revealed itself to me. But that path was sort of like obscured behind <laughs> some very thorny rose bushes because I was still completely seduced and sort of, they might, you know, I, I've described it as the kind of, you know, the, the magazine career was almost like a Swarovski encrusted pair of handcuffs. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, of course. It's a lifestyle. I was so sort of addicted almost to all of the glitz and glamour of that world. But I couldn't really see myself ever realistically leaving my job to go and start, I don't know, some like a blog about astrology. It just was like, no, not going to happen. And then about sort of six months of wrestling with this idea, wondering how to do it, speaking to a few friends about it, um, this job opportunity came up for my husband in New York. And it was kind of a, okay, that door's sort of closing for me anyway. Mm. Here is a complete blank slate. What am I going to do with it? Well, I've got, I kind of know what I'm going to do with it. And so it's been almost five years. Um, it's been about four years now since I actually started working on the project. But now I've been luminous. Like I said, it's an event series. It's, it's spun off um, a, an online mentoring program called Moon Club. Mm-hmm. We have hundreds of members all over the world who join us um, online for weekly rituals, webinars, seminars around um, sort of what we call spiritual activism. So using all your sort of spiritual tools to really kind of be your best self out in the world and bring your best self to your projects um, and to do some good in the world. And obviously you have my book coming out. So it's a world I never, when I have those first, when, I have, when that numinous idea first dropped into my consciousness, I could never have envisaged what it's become. Um, but I'm obviously just thrilled to be doing this work now. But I, the one thing that really, um, the worst thing as an Aries with Sagittarius rising, which you will understand. <laughs> Leo, Leo is that. Boredom. Boredom is the, the most difficult um, emotion for me to sit with and to experience <laughs> and to feel. And as much as I still feel, completely overwhelmed at times and there's a lot of anxiety and there's so many things to juggle and it's and I'm on 24 7 I'm never bored and to me that is um that's a signal and a sign I'm doing what I'm here to do yeah and you, I think you said it earlier in the interview actually and I think you know that thing that we can research or read about or we get totally enthralled in that thing that we lights us up you know that that is definitely a sign that that's where you need to go to your dharma and towards your passion and your purpose. Exactly, exactly. Mm. Yes. Do you have any advice? Because obviously we've got lots of people who are listening to your <laughs> books. Uh, you know, maybe their dharma or their passion and purpose isn't obvious to them. 
Like, what advice mm. do you have for somebody listening around how they can kind of dig a bit deeper? Well, there's a chapter on Dharma in my book, and there's a few things that you can sort of like practically start doing to sort of just begin to tap into what it might be. I um, I like to foster a deep connection with my sort of inner five year old. And I think that one thing you can do is really think back to when you were a small child, mm. before all of the kind of all of the shoulds about from school, from our parents, from society, from our, whatever our situation might be, before they all start to creep in and adulterate that kind of like pure five year old sort of consciousness of what do I love? You can think back to what you were really into as a child. Um, it's actually, I think that can be a real clue to what your dharma might be. As I said, I think my dharma underneath everything is really telling stories. And as a kid, my mum used to call me Radio Ruby. <laughs> he just, as soon as I knew how, as soon as I could, just to give her a running commentary on everything that was going on in my world, in her world, in my brother's world, <laughs> everything. Um, but she, she, um, I don't think she likes this. I think it was a little bit overwhelming for her. So she really encouraged me to read and write because obviously these were things that I, that came very naturally. I was a very early reader. I love to write and I love to write stories. So she really encouraged that in me. Um, and so I think there was a, there was a clue right there, you know? Yeah. yeah. I also, uh, with the astrology piece, so how things have all come together, right? If I think back to that five-year-old woman, so this was gold GPs. I remember learning about age three that I'd been born in the year of the dragon. Um, just I have vivid memories of kind of going around telling people about this and like <laughs> doing this kind of funny dragon face. And so I think the astrology thing, even then, really sparked something in me as a like, oh, what's this other kind of mystical world that I'm somehow embodying or a part of or connected to in a way? So I think that had always been a fascination. And then the other thing was dressing up, like many children. I loved dressing up and um, I think that really, you know, I had a, a dressing up box that was full of all these incredible, you know, fine vintage pieces and vintage pieces, that sounds so fancy, <laughs> but you know what I mean, kind of secondhand shop, like <laughs> bits and bobs that I picked up. And I think um, my favourite, you know, as soon as I got home from school every day, it was off with whatever I was wearing and on with some kind of an outfit to experiment again with. And I think interestingly, the fashion world is also about telling stories. It's about telling stories through clothing. Um, so the three things were always there for me. You know, it's just that they got kind of squeezed and they, they were being expressed in ways that weren't necessarily serving. Because the other piece of the Dharma piece mm. is that when you are fully living and expressing your Dharma, you're in, you are in some way contributing to the greater good, in some way yeah. participating in a way that's helpful to others. Um, so, yeah, I think it's really fascinating because, um, you know, now you kind of look back on your life, you can see the pieces that were they're now kind of weaving together. And, like, and I totally agree with you. I think when we are um, on passion and on purpose and living our dharma, that there is an element of service that comes with that. And I think we weave through our background and bring all those points together and take it to have a bigger impact on the planet. Exactly. And it's I think that that word service or giving back, it can be so loaded and feel almost quite dutiful in a way. Mm. You know? Or you can automatically go to, oh, that's about volunteering or it's about charity work or it's something very... But actually, I like to think of service as actually just being... We're all of service. If we're, if we're participating and doing something with our work that is coming from a place of absolute authenticity and integrity, mm. it's kind of... Service could be just me sharing a story that helps somebody, you know, spark something in somebody that helps them then decide to do something that is ultimately fulfilling to them. Or it could equally be going to volunteer at a homeless shelter or whatever it is. But I think that removing the idea, like thinking, framing service as the idea of actually just participation, mm. but partici participation from a place of like true integrity and of wanting to just bring the best forth in the world that we can, be that an idea, a product, a service, whatever it is, that is, a, that is service as well. Mm. And for people listening, you know, maybe they have got an idea, like your numinous, new, mm. numinous. <laughs> I think numinous, but just put an N in Ah, okay, numinous. 
Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. I think you need more. <clears throat> need more oomph. But um, say they have got an idea, like you have the numinous. <laughs> it's gonna gonna come off my tongue now. Um, how did you get the courage to take that forward? Like you said, you toyed with the idea for a while. Like. When, you know, how did you get the courage to really kind of step into it? Because I think it is when we step into these things wholeheartedly that, you know, the impact really is felt. Well, I think from, it, it's, it's been quite, it was quite gradual. Mm. I, what I didn't do was kind of like, leave everything, go, well, I've got this much savings and I'm going to make it work by this time and sort of give myself a cliff to jump off. It was more of a gentle slope that I started kind of meandering down to kind of make it, make it a little, more of a gentle transition I suppose but how did I get the courage I think um for me it was a big a big part of it was kind of like god what if no one reads it or what if what I'm putting out there is just like irrelevant or whatever and I think doing it um it was just a bit of a deep breath moment and taking it one small step at a time I think a lot of the time particularly when we're thinking about our big dream our big vision we see this kind of like mountain in front of us and like right I must climb and I must do it fast when actually looking down at your feet and looking at you at just at the next one step is the way to do it you know rather than kind of like, ah it's more like a, okay one step I can do one step today I can do one thing today whatever that one thing is you know that one thing could be registering the domain it could be reaching out to someone about doing an interview like whatever it is that relates to your mm-hmm project um so I think but in terms of but it's still it was a scary moment just actually right pressing post on that first ever blog post <laughs> and in those moments I suppose um it is just a bit of a deep breath and a what have I got to lose you know <laughs> and is that um how you started with the book like tell us a bit about the book because obviously that's coming out on the 2nd of May which is it like okay US copy slightly different yeah but I've got the yeah. Very oh, pink. I've got the soft back color, kind of love pink. <laughs> it is a great color, yes. And you're matching your book, you realize. Exactly. <laughs> I think I need to. She's well. coordinated to her book. I love it. <laughs> Always. Um, so the book was the book was well, in a way. I mean, the book felt extremely aligned, and I think you might have touched on this. But when um, I think that once you really align with the path of what you're here, what you're here to do. That being in some way contributing something of value to society, let's let's frame service as that, contributing something of value to society. Mm-hmm. Once you start doing that, things do start magnetizing towards you. I'm not a big one for the whole law of attraction. I don't necessarily believe that just by sitting there, you know, doing mantras, you can kind of manifest all the things you need. You've got to be actively participating, okay. but that's you've got to be giving in order to receive. Mm-hmm. Kind of that feels to me much more you yeah. can't be you can't be passive in that you need to actually be acting in order for the things to be manifesting mm. but with the book felt very much like it was magnetized towards me I mean I a, less than a, just over a year after I'd launched Illuminous press post on that first yeah took the courage got the courage <laughs> uh, an editor at HarperCollins in the US reached out to me having found the online while she was just researching new voices in the kind of spiritual new age space I guess um and just said you know I think what you're doing is really fresh it's really exciting it meets it fills a missing gap it meets the missing an, an unresolved need an unmet need for this generation of spiritual seekers I suppose do you have a book proposal and at the time I didn't but I had just signed with an agent in the UK who um. likewise it was, it was setting up an agency She'd reached out to me going, I've watched everything, you know, I've watched you setting this up and I think it's really new and to be answering and, and a need. Um, could we represent you? So I got so I just signed with them this email from and I was like, Well, actually, guys, could you help me get a book proposal together? And they did and helped me pitch and, and it just kind of Wow, synchronicity. Yeah. So much synchronicity. How's this for synchronicity? I mean, I I know you are a believer <laughs> you are a believer in. You know, the little signs that we get. <laughs> so here's two signs I'm just going to quickly tell you about. Um, so when I went to, we actually pitched it in the UK first, and it was only half a comments in the UK who actually got back to us saying they were interested to meet me. And um, I had no idea, but when I went to meet with them, I didn't realise half a comments in the UK is owned by the same company, News Corp, that owns the Sunday Times. 
Mm-hmm. So I go to meet them and it's at the office of the Sunday Times where I used to work and it's six floors above or whatever. Yeah. <laughs> um, and I go to meet this woman and it's just like, wow, so I'm back in the old building, but up here now, kind of doing something completely different. And when I, I remember when I was getting those first things about not wanting, not feeling fulfilled in my job at Sunday Times, something that used to come to me was, I've got as much to say as all these people I'm writing about. Mm. I'm going to write about what I've got to say you know I would love to be the one being interviewed one day and here we are <laughs> but, um, but anyway there was, so it was interesting just to go back and then I meet this woman and it turns out the publisher who's now my UK publisher yeah. has a daughter a daughter called Ruby who has the same birthday as me oh wonderful but there were so many synchronicities like that to do with the book all along the way so yeah, it feels, I feel very fortunate because I know for so many authors, it's a struggle to kind of get it out there. And it's, um, yeah, I, it definitely feels like there was another force propelling it forward. The writing of it was definitely the hardest thing I've ever done. It was extremely taxing. But um, Well, I have to say, I'm really, I'm really enjoying it. So I'm a couple of chapters in, but no, genuinely really, really enjoying it. And of course, uh, we should touch on your love of astrology because yeah. you know, my kindred spirits yeah. in that absolutely uh, in that regard it's just incredible the insights that it gives you about your own life and, and for people looking like we're talking about their dharma their passion their purpose yeah. astrology is a great way isn't it for them to absolutely choose. absolutely and for me there's a big difference it, I mean I've always been fascinated by it and it's I think so many people are like who might not necessarily talk about it consistently throughout my throughout my ventures into the kind of online business world I hear that astrology is one of the biggest drivers for traffic both in apps and mm. on websites okay. and if you look at many kind of glossy magazine sites will have the astrology bit in the top right most clickable corner of their site but it really is like it's such it's a subject that pulls people in and people are so fascinated by it and I think wrongly the perception is that it's in some way narcissistic and that the reason people want to um, look at astrology is because they just want to talk about themselves or kind of like anything look about look at themselves. Um, but actually for me, astrology, rather than be just reading a monthly or weekly um, forecast, it really all started to kind of land for me in a much more useful way when I learned mm. to read my own chart, mm. which I go into in the chapter on astrology, just giving people the very basic tools of um birth chart interpretation and yes for me it's like yes I mean it is a tool for kind of looking at myself but rather not rather than in a narcissistic way in a in a self-development way you know I can look at things in my chart that explain to me my all of my deepest needs my impulses my talents my strengths and my weaknesses mm-hmm. and it's looking at the more difficult aspects too where you've got the greatest opportunities for growth because I can look at okay, so I have my moon in cancer and I'm extremely emotional. And this means that particularly when I'm, and it's square, my sun in, and Mercury in Aries, right? Sun and Mercury in Aries is very outgoing, very communicative, very confident in communication. But that square, which is a challenging angle to my moon, which is deep inner world, deep needs in cancer, which is super immers- emotional, very private. So it's been a huge challenge for me this past year where I've been doing more public speaking, for example, and more kind of sharing of my story and my truths vocally. I often will burst into tears. I, really, I think yeah. because one of, the, one of the things people are afraid of about public speaking is showing weakness or vulnerability when you're meant to be up there and I'm the one speaking and I've got it all together. I often cry in those situations and it's extremely painful for me. However, you're being real. Seeing that in my chart, I'm like, well, I, that's just part of who I am. And actually, I just, I have to embrace it, you know, and it's given me something to work with. Like I'm booking on a, a transformational speaking course this summer because it is something I really want to master. Mm-hmm. Um, and having seen that in my chart, I can then go, okay, well, this is a really important thing for me to work on. Because um, I think, it, you know, the more difficult placements in your chart, so I see them as the lessons that we're really here to learn. And we can, this is where free will comes in. We can either choose to, ignore those and just kind of get along kind of relying on all the strengths that we have in our chart or we can choose to say okay well here's what I need to learn and it's going to be painful it's going to be difficult and it may take a long time but in learning that I will evolve and I will progress and I will hopefully reach the end of my life having fulfilled 
what I'm here to do. And I love what you wrote about the the deeper insight it gave you into your relationship with your mother, because Mm -hmm. a way of healing your relationship with your mum, I thought it was really lovely. The whole book has been such a healing process. Like that's a theme that recurs throughout the whole book. And I think that for many women in particular, that can be a difficult relationship, but actually healing that relationship is so healing for yourself. Mm -hmm. If you think of yourself almost as an extension of your mother in many ways, I mean, she, you know, you're physically made of her and she births you and (laughs) <laughs> um, I think that healing that relationship is is really, really, it's been vital to me and something that I think that we um, possibly don't focus on enough in society in general. Um, but with astrology, it was the moon sign placement again. So she has her moon in Gemini, which is, extra, Gemini is the most talkative sign. The moon, again, like I said, is kind of deep-seated emotions. So she loves to talk about anything emotional. <laughs> She's actually a psychotherapist. <laughs> Ah, cool. <laughs> She's become a psychopath in later life, but her whole thing is like, let's talk it out. My moon in cancer is so private about my emotions. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so as a teenager going through the most kind of like difficult phases of kind of emotional development, I suppose, she was always, let's talk about it, tell me what's going on. And it just caused me to put up these huge barriers, my need for privacy, emotional privacy, and to just kind of like be in my own process. I put up these huge barriers which then lasted through to our adult relationship, of course. But it was being able to look at our two charts together and sort of realise this about her, that I was able to, as a mature individual, wanting to make things, you know, wanting to get remove these barriers, was able to, to kind of go, okay, well, it may be painful and difficult for me, but I'm going to open up to her. And just opening the door, even a crack, this huge burst of love just flooded through. And it was it's yeah wonderful I like well I think you know uh, a way of using astrology is so we can reach the highest version of ourselves because yeah. I think like you said it gives us a deeper understanding of who we are and our natural t- talents and abilities and mm-hmm. I think the other thing that's fast like I I think I said you I had an astrologer for quite a while yeah. which is it's yeah. just fascinating but it's really inspired me to go deeper in it actually because rather than give my power away and get someone else to read for mm-hmm. me it'd be great to go into a deeper level of understanding about my own chart. Exactly. Once you have your own chart and the ability to, even at a very basic level, look at it, you can read your weekly scope or you can read a monthly thing. And if it tells you anything about the placements of the planet, planets, you can actually just kind of look at your own chart and you get a much more accurate and in-depth reading than you ever will from something that's been written for everybody who happens to have the same sun sign as you. Mm-hmm. Um, which they're very, they're very useful. And obviously talented, talented readers um, can give very accurate um, and insightful readings on the, the generalized information. But having your own. And the other thing, I mean, how fabulous that you um, have someone you can see regular. But, you know, an in-depth reading can be expensive too. And mm, true, yeah. who, really, who really has, you know, whatever it is, 50, 100, 150 pounds to have a regular reading. And if you can do it for yourself, um, maybe you can minimise. Still go and see someone maybe once or twice a year for a more in depth, for a more in depth sort of catch up. But mm-hmm. doing it yourself, it's, I find it fascinating. And I will give a quick plug to the Astro Twins, who are the amazing astrologers yes. who I really learned this skill with. On and I mean, what better way to do it? They host an annual retreat to Tulum in Mexico. Oh wow, astrologer. And for anyone who is a fan of astrology, Kitty, I think you, I think you <laughs> I'd love it. Yeah. <laughs> I, love it. I can see myself doing it already. So I'm going to be for this year, but maybe look into it for next year. And they have people from all over the world, about 20 women, of course, it's always all women, um, kind of just, just some astro geekery, like all week long on a beach. I mean, it was just wow. amazing. <laughs> and I'd love to know, did you, because obviously were you into astrology when you met your husband? Because that's the other thing fascinating about the chart. Yes. Not as into, and I certainly, I'd always known he was a Pisces. Um, I've got a Pisces as well. Oh, you do? Yeah, yeah. He's a good one. They drink like a fish, or used to drink. Mm. All right, likewise, yes. Um, <laughs> I knew he was a Pisces. Um, I didn't know really the rest of his chart until I went on this retreat, because they'd asked us to print out the charts of a couple of people we were close to in our lives. So I did his chart and my mum's chart. She's also a Pisces. Oh, wow. Um, and we learned how to look at the two charts next to each other. And honestly, when I looked at my chart next to my husband's, it's just, I mean, it, it's one of those 
one of those sickeningly lovey-dovey relationships where it really was love at first sight. And when I say love at first sight, I don't mean it was kind of like, oh, instant swoon. It was more like a, here's someone I just know this person and I know this person's going to be in my life forever. And it was just a no question. Instant connection. From the first Mm. words we said to each other, it was like a physical, multidimensional, just knowing of like, oh yeah, it's you. Oh yeah. (laughs) Which I'm again, so, so grateful to the experience because I think that lots of us don't even assume that that kind of a connection exists, but it does. Um, Anyway, when I looked at our charts next to each other, it was just like, oh, so many planets like conjunct, which means they're in the same placement. So there's just this very easy merge, like no argument. We never fight like so many conjunctions, um, a healthy opposition of our Marses, which is that kind of like opposites attract sort of thing as well. Um, Your Mars sign representing kind of like sexual attraction and so that's, 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 I guess, it's maybe kept some of the, the spice and the friction over 18 years together, you know. Um, so, yeah, just very, very, very compatible charts, which is, yeah, lovely. <laughs> oh, well, for those of you interested in astrology, then Ruby's book gives you a really good overview about, uh, obviously, you can get the, the chart from the Astro Twins, can't you, for free, which is great. And then I have been digging into my own chart through the book. <laughs> Thank you so much for listening to kitty talks be sure to head over to our kittytalks.com website become a member of our exclusive club and you'll get free interviews and access to our private facebook group exclusive webinars and secret success interviews see you there